first, before we get into the stories, I want to give you stories of three moms. But before we get into those, let's just look at what the Bible says about moms and dads, for that matter. If you look at Ephesians 6, here's what it says. Ephesians 6 says, honor your father and your mother. So we'll focus on moms today. We'll talk about dads next month. So honor your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, commandments with benefits. If, you're, if you honor your father and mother, you honor your mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. Now, Paul didn't just make this up. He was pulling it from Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. And it's right from the Tanakh, right? Actually from the Torah, which says, if you honor your father and your mother, God will bless you. You have a long life. Things will go well with you. Now, does that mean that if you honor your father and mother, you're going to live to be 157 years old? Not necessarily, but I want to tell you this, that your mom's love and your relationship with your parent is so important, not just when you're a kid, but your whole life. And honoring that relationship will result in blessing, as will dishonoring that relationship result in consequences. And so he's telling us here is to honor your father and your mother, in your thoughts about your mom, in your speech about your mom, in your stories and rhetoric about your mom, and in your behavior toward your mom. Honor your mom, and I promise you, you won't have that deficit of damage that you carry with you the rest of your life. If there's unforgiveness, that if you could offer forgiveness and allow grace to fill that area, watch what happens. Your life will be blessed. You'll have a good life. And if you harbor resentment and bitterness against someone who it was or is that close to you, it will, I'm sorry, it will be the same as planting bad seeds in a good garden. Now you may be saying, well, you don't know my situation. You're right, I don't. But God does. So I just want to encourage you to take that word and live it, apply it, and watch what happens. My hope for you is that you'll have a long life, and not only that, that things will go well for you. <laughs> So we're obviously not all moms, but there's some moms here. And some of us have had moms that have gone on to glory and are in heaven. And some have moms that live far away. And some, you know, I meet people that have never met their mom. Or their mom is estranged from them. And so what we want to do here is to honor them through our thoughts about them, our consideration of them. And regardless of who you are or how old you are or how famous or how successful you are, your mother is probably the most, the single most important and most uh, significant influence on the early years of your life. If you're like most people, those formidable early years were greatly influenced by your mom. And God chose that. God chose that person to be the one who brought you into this world. And in most cases, the one who shaped you into who you've become, at least as a child. Now, my mom's story was unique because she is someone that never met her real mom. And, she, you know, when she talks about it, when she's, she's gone on to be with the Lord three years ago, but when she talked about her mother, it was with incredible uh, significance. For instance, when she was, I believe, less than a year old, her real mom died. And so what was the Jewish tradition back then, they would arrange a marriage for the widow, widower so that he would uh, marry another woman right away. And so they got married, but the, the new wife, the new wife of my grandfather said, I will do this as long as Phyllis never knows that I'm not her real mom and I'll raise her as if she's my own. So that was the family secret. And so as she's being raised and other children came into that family, she, had, she never knew that this woman that she called mom was not her real mom or her birth mom because she had died. And one time when she was in a uh, teenager, and she found out through a, a relative who kind of blurted it out. That wasn't necessarily a relative, like a friend of the family turned out to be a relative. Anyway, she found out the truth, and the truth had been hidden about her, about her mother, and it affected her. It rocked her world. It rocked the foundation, because her identity about who her mom was was shattered. That's how important the role of mother is in our lives. Motherhood is very very powerful. It can either be one of the most empowering or the most discouraging things in our life. And you look at the lives of these great men, presidents and world leaders, and very often some of them will talk to you or speak about how influential their mom was to them or their mom's words were them. 
You know, I think about George Washington. He says, all I am, I owe to my mother. Abraham Lincoln says, I remember my mother's prayers, and they've always followed me and clung to me my whole life. Everything I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Billy Graham says this, of all the people I've ever known, she, his mom, had the greatest influence on him. Not some theologian, Bible scholar in the seminary he went to, his mom, his mom. Many presidents and world leaders will say this, and why is that? Because the role of mom is very significant and very powerful. There's the old quote that says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, right? Because of the influence that you, you as mom, or your mom, had on you, is impenetrable. It just, it goes so deep inside us. So, all moms are special. But I want to say this, is that you moms, who are able to take the Word of God, and take the faith that you have in the Lord, and convey that to your children, you are giving them a great gift that will last the rest of their life greater than anything you can buy for them, greater than any opportunity that you can make for them. This precious gift is a relationship with Jesus. And I want to look at three women of the Bible who did just that. So there's three stories of these three women of the Bible that I like to talk about. So, you know, some of them you may have heard of, some maybe not. But here's who they are. They're amazing moms of the Bible. And they are Eunice. Who's ever heard of Eunice? Naomi, who's ever heard of Naomi? Okay. Spongetta, who's ever heard of Spongetta? No, she's not one. The widow of Zarephath, who's ever heard of that? All right, so here's the story of Eunice, Naomi, and the widow of Zarephath. So let's roll back first to the, the widow of Zarephath. The widow of Zarephath. This is a single mom. We don't know her name, but she encounters Elijah, a single mom, obviously a widow. And let's take up 1 Kings 17 in this Let's listen to these stories as if you're reading a story about your mom or a mom that you know or just some old mom in the Old Testament that you want to hear about. And here's what it says. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon, which is way up north towards the coast in what is Lebanon now. I've instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. And as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow, a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And as she's going to get it, he called to her and said, Bring me a bite of bread, too. And this guy already starts out really presumptuous, you know? Can you imagine? <laughs> but it goes on. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil on the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. Now bear in mind, there's severe famine. Everyone's dying around her. All her neighbors are dying from starvation. And she just, she just figures, I have a little bit. I can make a little something. And then we'll eat that, and that'll be our last meal, and we'll die of starvation just like everyone else. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and crops grow again. He's speaking a word of promise of faith to her. He says, do this, because God is going to bless this land again. And there will be crops, and there will be food, there will be produce. Verse 15, so she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. For there was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. See, this is a woman of great faith. This is a woman who really had nothing to lose. However, if the first verse we said, the Lord made it known to her, made it known to her that Elijah is going to come, and he's going to, he instructed her to listen to him. So she recognized him as a man of God. Now bear in mind, this is not a Hebrew woman. This is a woman from Sidon. And she responds to the word of God by being obedient despite circumstances. You hear me? Sometimes you and I are in face with the exact same thing. We see what circumstances are, but we hear what the Lord is saying. 
And we have a choice. Should we just do what seems practical and seems prudent? Or should we listen to what God's saying and trust him by faith? And she did that. And because she did, she ate for the rest of her life. Now, was the rest of her life great? No problems? No. Immediately after that, if we, if we were to read the rest of the scripture, we'd see that her son got really sick. So sick that he died. And then she even complained and said, you know, what did you do? Did, did you bring me this calamity so that my son would die? And so Elijah stretched him out over her son and raised her son from the dead. You can read it in uh, 1 Kings 17 sometime. He raised her son from the dead. This is a woman who showed great faith to God. And God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we see this as an unnamed, unmarried, single mom. But she believed in Elijah's God. And God rewarded her. This is an example of great faith. Can you imagine being this woman? But you know what, folks? In many ways, you and I are this woman. We're faced with choices. We're faced with circumstances. But as we're listening to the word of God, he says, I will provide for you. It's not your own means that brings food to your table. It's me. It's my hand of providence. And what's interesting is that Jesus used this woman as an example. When Jesus was speaking in the home synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4, he's giving them examples of people that aren't even Jewish that showed great faith. And he used the widow of Zarephath as a shining star example of great faith. Moms, there's going to be times when the greatest thing that you can do for your children or your grandchildren is not just to look at preserving and protecting and, and by your own resources providing for them. For you, as tempting as it may be, the greatest thing that you can do is to completely trust in God and his resources for the blessing of your family. Amen? Amen. That is the story of the widow of Zarephath, the mom. The second one is Naomi. We'll get to Eunice, because I know you're wondering who Eunice is, right? But the, this is about Naomi. Now, she, this is a mother-in-law. How many of you are mother-in-laws? All right, none of you. Okay, all right, I see the hands. How many of you have a mother-in-law or had a mother-in-law? Okay, so here's, here's the thing. This story is taken from the Book of Ruth, and when we read about the Book of Ruth, we almost always look at and talk about Ruth. But now we're gonna talk about Naomi. Let's listen to the words. Ruth 1.1 1, 1 says this, In the days when the judges ruled Israel, severe famine once again came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judea uh, left his home and went to live in the country of Moab. He took his wife and his two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. Their two sons were Melon and Kilion. They were Ephratites and from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died. And Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other married a woman named uh, Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilian died. So this left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. You following this tragedy so far? This woman, uh, she, you know, she, she gets married. She has two sons. These two sons marry women, other women. And so she has a whole family. And all the men in the family died. And then she's left with just her two daughter-in-laws. Okay, so that's what's left of the family. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to their homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, before we go here, let me just explain her daughters-in-law are not Judeans. She is. She belongs in that land. This is Judea near Bethlehem, very close to Jerusalem. She's a Jewish woman. But these daughter-in-laws are Moabites. And she's thinking, you know, I'm not really even really related to them necessarily because their sons, my sons died. Why am I bringing them from their country to come and live in my country? I'm going to give them an out. I'm going to say, okay, listen, you guys are released. You know, why don't you find other husbands or something? You guys can just go and live back in Moab, probably find another husband and, and have a family. So here's where it picks up. And Naomi heard, I'm sorry, but on the way, Naomi said to her, uh, this is verse 8, to her two daughter-in-laws, 
Go back to your mother's homes. And, and may the Lord reward you for the kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. You see what she did? Say, so Naomi is saying to her daughters-in-law, I'm releasing you. Go back, find other men, find other husbands. And they all kind of said this tearful, broken down, weeping goodbye. They had joined lives, they were family, they were there during the good times when all three of those men were alive, then all three men died, and they're, they're weeping and they're saying goodbye. But, verse 10, no, they said, we want to go with you to your people. And again, they wept together. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. And she was gone. Now, Orpah, incidentally, this is, if you look up there, this is actually the name of Oprah. If you look up Oprah Rumpy's profile, uh, her name was actually misquoted, mispronounced or something. But that has nothing to do with the scripture, so let's go back to the scripture. <laughs> I just had to put that in there because I thought it was interesting. Don't you think it's interesting? Okay, that's not in any of the verses in the Bible. But Ruth, this is what I want you to look at. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her God. You should go do the same. Now pause there. Look, think of this. She's given an out. But Ruth showed great faith here. Ruth replied, verse 16, don't ask me to leave you and to turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me so severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. In other words, she brought her along. So Naomi has now taken this woman, the widow of her late son with her to her homeland. Now usually we read this story and we talk about you know Ruth's great faith just like the widow of Zarephath. Not Hebrew people but they show great faith in, in the Hebrew God. But Naomi she is an example of great faith. She's an example of a mom who in the face of tremendous loss she lost her husband and not only that her two and only sons died. In, in, in the face of great loss she reached out to a younger woman to comfort her, to counsel her, to care for her. She took Ruth back to, to Jerusalem, back to Bethlehem with her, and guided her into a life. And she not only provided for her, but, but she was able to, to, um, to counsel her towards another marriage, and that marriage was a blessing. It's amazing what Naomi did in laying down her life for another. Now, Ruth went on to marry, and she became great. She actually became the great-grandmother of King David, and she ends up in the genealogy of Jesus. But Naomi is forgotten sometimes. And I want to tell you, women, there's a very special ministry that you have, a very special ministry that you have to younger women, and that is to comfort them, to counsel them, to guide them. You know, Titus says that the older women teach the younger. And so sometimes you feel... Guys, women particularly, sometimes you feel like your time is up. Your you know, uh, um, fruitfulness is up. And that's not true. It's never too late. God will put younger women in your life, some whom you're related to, some that you're not. And you will be a Naomi to them. And you'll bring them out of this desperate circumstance of grieving and loss and weeping and bring them to a place where they are reestablished and reprovided for and perhaps even sent on their way to the next most amazing part of your life. So I want you to take a lesson from Naomi to not give up when everything goes wrong and just live out your days. But remember, God has purposes for you that may have everything to do with another person. Now we're going to move on. And this is the last one. We're talking about Lois. I said Eunice, but we're going to talk about her mom, Lois. Lois is Timothy's grandmother. How many of you are grandmoms? How many of you are grandmoms and don't want to admit it? Ah, oh, there's the hands, okay. Listen, the grandmother is the most precious, most precious person in the family, in the, in the lives of children and their grandchildren. And I want you to look at Lois as an example of a believing grandmother and the incredible influence that she has, subtly, but incredible influence that she has 
on Timothy. Lois was a, a Jewish believer in Lystra. Uh, she's the grandmother of Tim, Timothy. And we read in Acts that, that we hear about, um, well, let's read it here. Paul went to, first to Derby and then went on to Lystra where there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. And so we don't know much about the father. But if he was a believer, we probably would have known that from the scripture. And so we learn right away about the mother. She's a Jewish believer. In other words, she's a person who lives in Lystra, who is born Jewish and believes that Jesus is Messiah. And she's teaching her son this. Now, right there, they're talking about Eunice. But when we look at 2 Timothy, we see this. He says in 1.5, he says, I'm reminded, he's talking, Paul talking to Timothy, I'm re reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. This is a small passing verse, but there's so much here. Friends, you, and let's just talk to all of us, you have a place in your family, especially as we get older and we have children, and then our children have children. We have a vantage point, a, a point of, of, of strategic influence where we can influence a whole generation, two generations of people. And what Paul is saying here, and the reason I believe Paul brought Timothy under his wing as his prodigy, as his apprentice, is because of the foundation of faith that Timothy had to be the next leader of the church. You with me? So when Paul is and this is one of the last things that Paul writes, as Paul is finding himself closer and closer to death, he's looking for, for people to bring up, disciples. He's looking for men who he's, he's discipled and poured into that are coming up to lead the church. And he does a, he does a lot of pouring into and, and affirming Timothy. And one of the things he recognizes in Timothy is a strong foundation of faith. Where did he get it? From the women in his life from the women in Timothy's life. First, obviously, the grandmother. First lived in Lois, and then eventually in Eunice as well. And this reminds us that grandmoms, I want to remind you that you have tremendous influence on your life. And I'll say that even to, to grandpas as, as well. I think the reason I'm standing in front of you today is because of my grandfather. The first in our family to, to receive faith, and it was probably the most unlikely, because if you were to look at Saul Tomberg in the early 1970s or maybe in the late 60s, he was sort of a bitter Jewish man, had nothing to do with Jesus. <laughs> but the Lord captivated his heart, and he gave his life to the Messiah. And he was so excited about it that he came up to New Jersey and he preached to all of us, to my mom and to me and to my other brothers and sisters. And because of that grandparent, I was lit up at an early age, a foundation of faith, following through, so that I'm standing here before you today because of the influence of a grandparent. And so never underestimate the influence that you as grandparents have on your grandchildren. You might say, well, listen, you don't know my situation. My kids are not even raising them in their faith. It doesn't matter. Maybe they don't even have any time for God. It doesn't matter. You have the ability from your vantage point to speak life to give a foundation of the Word of God, to, to insert scriptures into your dialogue with them, and that will not return void. So this is an admonition to you as grandparents that time is not up. There's a lot of influence that you can have. Uh, Lois was able to make that incredible impact on, on Timothy's life. And let's face it, Timothy, he, uh, you know, he influenced the entire world. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.14, do we have that one? This was written just days, probably, or weeks before Paul's death. So one of the last things he wrote to Timothy, which was one of the last books. And he says this, But you must be remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. You know that they are true, for you know that they, you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from trusting in Christ Jesus. Friends, there's nothing better that you can give your children than a foundation of faith. There's nothing better, especially in this age where lies abound in every area, to give them the truth of the gospel. 
Now, I'm not saying that when, you come, when they come over for babysitting that you just beat them over the head with the Bible until they read you know, 15 chapters. But what I am saying is listen to what they say and respond with the wisdom of God. And I guarantee you are planting deep seeds, seeds of faith that will someday grow up and become trees of righteousness, trees of truth in a world that is desperately in need of truth. So moms, all you moms, moms, grandmoms, moms-in-law, moms-to-be, whatever it might be, you have a special position in your family. I encourage you, whether your kids are really small, but whether they're older, whether they've you know, gone on and have kids of their own, your words, your influences, and your teaching have a powerful impact on the lives of your family. Don't forget it. We honor you as you do that. And don't ever give up that mantle of authority to anything or anyone else. Now, I want to close with this. I've been talking to moms, but now I'm going to talk to you who have ever had a mom. Is there anybody here that has ever had a mom? Has a mom ever had a mom? So good 50, 60% of us here. Listen, we are designed to need a mother's love. God created us that way. And it's not just when we were kids. We were designed to, to need and crave and desire a nurturing, protecting, caring love. And we get that. And, 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 and unless the enemy has really destroyed you know, a family, and as we see it all the times in dysfunctional families, you, when you were a baby, were receiving care. You were receiving nurture. You were receiving uh, compassion. You were receiving protection from God to your mother to you. And you're wired that way. You need that. But what happens is sometimes we grow up and we, we, we get less of that and we become independent of our moms and perhaps our moms pass away. But we still have the need for compassion. We have the need for that kind of protection. And if we are going to admit it, we sometimes will deny that need. And we try to just toughen up and say, I don't need compassion and protection. I'm a man. You know, I'm a strong, independent woman. But I want you to know that your heart is, desi is designed to need love. And, and you need a compassionate love. You need a protective, nurturing type of love. And why am I saying that? Because it seems hopeless if we need that kind of love and our mom's passed away or we've grown up and we can't get it. I want to tell you today that Jesus wants to give you that love. Jesus wants to be your protector. He wants to be the one whom you can cry to. And he wants to give you compassion and nurture. He wants to preserve the tenderness of your heart, not grow, allow it to grow hard so you don't admit that you need that love anymore. Jesus is love. You know, Jesus is all of God. He says, I and the Father are one. And 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Jesus is the embodiment of love. And not just tough love. Not just, you know, you know, discipleship, get things in order kind of love, admonish you, chide you when you do wrong kind of love. Compassionate, tender love, nurturing love. Jesus wants to be your mother. Whoa, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Now he's really off the rails. First, he's like a grown man saying we should all be like babies. And now he's saying Jesus wants to be your mother. Wait, let me, let me rephrase that. We all are designed this way. Even Paul, you know, when, when Paul was writing um, his kind of thank you notes in Romans 16, if you remember, if you ever read Romans 16, he's thanking people and he's, he's recognizing people that did good things for him. He, he thanks Phoebe, the, the, uh, the elder, the deacon in Centria, and, and many other people, a litany of names. And one of them is Rufus. He said, greetings to Rufus, and please thank your mom, Rufus. This is in Romans 16, 13. And he says, and thank your, your mom because she was a mother to me. You know, we can be moms to someone else. Jesus really encourages motherhood. What was he saying on the cross when he sees John? He's suffering. He sees John weeping. He sees Mary weeping. He recognizes Mary is going to have need of a son, and John needs a mom. And what does he say? He says two things. He says, woman. He's, he's dying on the cross, by the way. <laughs> this is in John 18. He says, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. He's making sure these, these needs, motherhood needs, are met. So let me go back to this about Jesus as a mom, because this sounds sort of like, you know, what it would. Jesus shows the love of a mother. I believe that we all need compassion. 
We all need that nurturing love. We all need the wings of a mother's protection. I, I, I was looking for, for pictures that, you know, that show really nice motherhood pictures, like smiling babies. And, but this is what I came up with. This struck me as I was going through some photographs. And how many of you have ever been that little girl? I'll ask you more straight. How many of you are that little girl? How many of you ever find yourself weeping inside, but maybe the tears don't come out your eyes, and you feel something or someone holding you, nurturing, protecting you, telling you everything's going to be okay? How many of you need that? I want to tell you, your heart was created for that type of love. And the good news is that Jesus offers that type of love. At the end of his life, Jesus was looking at Jerusalem. He's about to take on the cross and die, rise again, and then eventually ascend. And he's, he's looking at Jerusalem. And he's weeping. He's weeping. Because he longed to do this to these people who he was sent to to teach and to bring into relationship with the Father. And he longed to do this, but he was hurt in his heart. And that's why he's lamenting, the scripture says. And he says this, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it's Matthew 23, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I have wanted to gather your children together. As what? As a hen protects her shakes beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And listen, I'm not saying that God's a woman, but I am saying this, is that love, that love of protecting, as only a mother hen or a mother would know, protection, compassion, that love is coming from the heart of Jesus, directed at these people who are rejecting him, but I want to tell you that same love is still alive in the heart of Jesus for you and for you and for you and for me. How, how he longs to gather us as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, showing compassion, showing nurture and protection. So friends, Jesus longs to nurture you, to feed you, to protect you, to take care of you in a way that quite honestly only a mother can because he is the embodiment of love. So as we close, I want you to do this. I want you to, to ask the Lord to be that to you right now. To, to even bring up the thing perhaps that you're hiding or you, you've, um, you've stuffed. Maybe something of pain, maybe something of disappointment, maybe something of woundedness. And allow him to be your mom, or at least show the mother's love. Especially for those of you whose moms are not able to be with you anymore. God is love. Obviously, I believe that God is our Father. He's, he's our Father. But there's a mother's love that maybe God short-circuited that you still need. Where are you going to get that? We're all going to get it from Jesus.